is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning, Santon Sports Club. Oh, hello. I spoke to one of your colleagues last week about becoming a member of your club and I'd like to go ahead and join, if I can do it over the phone. Absolutely. I'll start by taking a few details, if I may. Of course. What's your name? It's Alex Coos. Can you spell your surname? It's C-O-O-Z-E. Lovely. I've got that. And are you a student or in employment? Employed. Thank you. And can I ask, what's your job? I'm a doctor. Right. Thanks. Now, we don't need to get your full address at this stage, but could I just take your postcode? <laughs> if I can remember it, <laughs> I've only just moved. Yeah, oh, yes, it's uh, GT1. Right. And then 2BN. Is that VN? Uh, no, BN. Sorry. Now, one last question in this section. Can I just ask how you heard about us? Was it from a friend? Actually, I read about the club in a newspaper. It. Uh... That's fine. Thank you very much. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Now, we do offer different types of membership according to which facilities you want to use and when. Yes, I gathered that, but my schedule's a bit problematic. I mainly want to use the gym, and that'll be after about 7pm when I finish work. Fine, right. And will you be interested in swimming? I understand you have both an indoor and an outdoor pool. That's right. <laughs> I'm not a fan of swimming, actually, and certainly don't want to be there when it gets very packed in the evenings. Um, I think I'd only want to use the outdoor one and during the day, when I can get a bit of sunbathing in. And when the children are at school, of course, so it's a bit quieter. A lot of our clients prefer that. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> and I might occasionally want to have a game of badminton, you know... Uh, and I suppose I'd like to book courts on Saturdays and Sundays when I can organise a game with friends. Right. And would you be wanting to use our other club facilities, such as the sauna, steam room or tanning bed? They're open all day until 9pm. Well, I think I'd only want to use the steam room and probably after I've been doing heavy exercise. So shall I put that down as evenings? Sorry, no, I'd probably only use it on Saturdays and the occasional Sunday, you know, when I have more time to relax. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. 
Part 2. You will hear a discussion between two psychology students and their tutor. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. So, how did you find the lecture yesterday? Reasonably interesting, but he sort of rushed through Maslow's work, which, considering it's been covered before, is fine for everyone else except me, who missed the last lesson. Why don't you fill him in then, Tina? Me? Oh, OK. Well, basically, it's simple enough. We all have certain needs, and what Maslow did was group them into categories. Depending on how successful your life has been or what stage of life you are at, your needs change and you shift from one of Maslow's categories into another. First, there's your basic needs. Physiological needs, the professor said. Is that right? Very good. These needs are pretty obvious. They're our most basic ones. Things every human needs to survive and function, like air, water, food, clothing and shelter. It's not rocket science, this bit. Maslow just points out that until we have satisfied those basic needs, our desires don't evolve into anything more complex and we don't seek any greater form of fulfilment. Isn't that a bit irrelevant today? Not really. Millions of people in the developing world are still fighting to fulfil these needs, fighting for their very lives every day. Good point. So anyway, Maslow represented what he called his hierarchy of needs on a pyramid or, in 2D, a triangle with physiological being at the base, presumably. Yes, it's obvious, isn't it? What's at the other end of the spectrum, then? Well, to be at the pinnacle, you've got to have mastered the other levels of need. Then you are in the self-actualization zone. This is a place where you are very at one with yourself and looking to make the absolute most of your skills, talent and potential. You can only focus on maximising these, though, of course, if, as Maslow reminds us, you're fulfilled in every other sense. And what are these in-between levels, then? Well, after you've found food and water and shelter and so on, the next step is to fulfil your safety requirements. Safety does not just mean your physical safety, though. That's far too simplistic. It's also about your emotional safety, your job security and so on. And let me guess, after that it's the need for esteem. No. Maslow reasoned that after your physiological and safety needs are fulfilled, the next most urgent requirement is for friendship, intimacy, companionship and so on. You know, on an emotional level, building a family, having relationships, etc. Only then, after you have found a sense of belonging, does the need for esteem take precedence, he argues. Presumably that's the need to feel accepted and valued. Yes, but more on that later. Do you feel more comfortable now? Yes. Thank you both. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. OK, now that you are both familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, let's look at a few cases in point. Case 1. Uh, crime boss in the slums of Mumbai, what do you think? Surely very low. Physiological, I'd have said. But he has food and shelter. A shed is hardly shelter. And how is living from hand to mouth every day adequate from a nutritional perspective? Oh, of course. You're right if you look at it objectively. But remember that human psychology is far more complicated than that. When quizzed, this person surprised researchers. First of all, he regarded his shed as adequate shelter and was completely content there. 
Secondly, he generally felt satisfied with his level of food intake. Thirdly, being the crime boss of the slums, he felt very safe, arguing that no one would ever touch him. He had no self-esteem issues either, since he had the respect of his fellow slum dwellers. It may have been fear, but he perceived it as respect. That is all that matters, and was quite content with who he was. I see. So it's not just about the reality of your situation, but also how you perceive that reality. Exactly. Most people would be very low on the hierarchy in his position, feeling like they wanted and needed much more. He did not. Now, what about case two, a multi-millionaire rock star? Well, you'd naturally assume he's fulfilled his physiological and safety needs, but when you read on through his profile, look here, he's plagued by paranoia and thinks someone is trying to kill him. On that basis, given his state of mind, he must believe that his safety is compromised. So safety must be his primary concern. Very good. And look here at case three, a property magnet. Having suffered badly during the recession, his portfolio of properties is in danger of being repossessed. In fact, look, he's in danger of losing everything and being left without even enough to support himself. Wow, so I guess he's gone from very high up right down to the bottom. Exactly. Even his basic needs are no longer secure. An excellent example of how there can be movement both ways on the pyramid. Case four, a housewife. She must have some esteem issues, surely. Read on. She is quite content and well respected and loved by her friends and family. What's more, being a housewife is all she ever wanted to do, and she has excelled at the task. Therefore, forget esteem. This lady has maximised her potential in her eyes. She's right at the top. And case five, a very sad case. It is what it is. There are always innocent victims of war, and he was left with nothing—not even a home over his head. Every day is a struggle to survive. How sad! And last but not least, case six: another rock star, though a different story. He says the only thing he craves is friendship. He has everything, but is awfully lonely. I think it's obvious where he is on Maslow's hierarchy. Indeed. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk about safety in different regions. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here to talk to you about staying safe on holiday. Before I came this evening, I did a little research on where students like to go for their holidays and came up with two different regions: Latin America and India. So, um, I've been looking at the crime figures for both areas, and I thought I'd start by talking a bit about that. Then I'll give you some advice about how to avoid becoming a victim of crime. Okay, first of all, let's look at what kinds of crime are committed most in different regions. Um, okay, I'll start with India. Generally. India isn't thought of as a dangerous place for individuals, but there has been an increase in handbag theft in recent years. So keep an eye on your bag when you're out in the street. Right now, let's look at Latin America.、Mm. 
Of course, you do realise that not all Latin American countries are the same, but it is true to say that guns are used in a higher percentage of crimes across the region. Looking at the figures, it seems that gun crime is a serious problem throughout. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. I can see some of you are thinking that it all sounds rather dangerous, but I know lots of people who've been there and had a really great time. They followed advice from the authorities, like making sure they didn't wear expensive jewellery in the street. And I'd certainly advise anyone travelling to Latin America to do the same. Another thing you should be careful of is not to go to lonely places at night, but of course that's the same anywhere. But I must say, you do have to be very careful in some parts of Latin America when you take your money out of a cash machine. Sometimes you find that thieves stand very close to people at cash machines and take their money as it comes out. Okay, so now I'll finish by talking a little bit about India. I've actually been to India, and I didn't have any feeling that it was dangerous at all. First of all, I went on an organised tour with a group of people. This is definitely the best way to go because it's so much safer. I mean, I didn't go anywhere without the group, and we had a tour guide who spoke the local language and knew the area. In fact, I remember now, she warned us not to go off with strangers, even if they seem nice and friendly. But again, you wouldn't do that at home either, would you? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. To part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk on the writer Charles Dickens, given by a university lecturer to a group of students. First, look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five. As you listen to the first part of the talk, tick the appropriate box for questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Good morning. My name is Professor Sarah Lennon, and I'm here today to talk to you about the works of one of the greatest writers in the English language, Charles Dickens. He wrote many books. And if we bear in mind that there are over two thousand characters in his stories, we can get an idea of the complexity of his work. I've selected one novel from your reading list that I would like to talk about to illustrate his genius, namely Dombey and Son. But before we look at this work in earnest, I thought it might be a good idea to have a quick look at his life. And also at a few of the major events that happened during his lifetime, so that we can try to put his writing into perspective. 
Dickens was born on the 7th of February, 1812, at the time when his father was working in Portsmouth Dockyard. His father was transferred to London in 1814. To help give us a picture of the time Dickens was born into, it's worth noting that in 1814, when Dickens was two, the first efficient steam locomotive was constructed in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. Then, in 1817, the year that Queen Victoria was born and Waterloo Bridge in London was opened, the Dickens family moved away from London. And to give Dickens' life a literary perspective, in the following year, works by other famous English writers were published, Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey and Persuasion, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Scott's The Heart of Midlothian. When Dickens was almost ten, his family circumstances changed, and in 1822 the family moved back to London. In 1824, John Dickens was arrested for debt and imprisoned in the Marshalsea near London Bridge in London. This event had a profound effect on Dickens' writing. From 1827, Charles Dickens had various jobs as solicitor's clerk, freelance reporter and newspaper reporter. Before the speaker continues the talk, look at questions 36 to 40. As you listen to the second part of the talk, answer the questions. In December 1833, Dickens had his first story, A Dinner at Poplar Wall, published in The Monthly Magazine. In the same year, the SS Royal William became the first vessel to cross the Atlantic Ocean by steam alone. In 1836, two important events happened. Dickens published the first series of sketches by Boz, and the publishers, Chapman and Hall, suggested his first novel, The Pickwick Papers. In April of the same year, the second major event took place. Dickens married Catherine Hogarth. And in 1837, the year that Queen Victoria became Queen of England, and Samuel B. Morse developed Telegraph, the novel Oliver Twist began publication in Bentley's Miscellany in 24 monthly instalments. You may not be aware that serialisation like this was common in Dickens' time. In the subsequent year, that is in 1838, the serialisation of Nicholas Nickleby started and appeared in 20 instalments. Dickens' novel The Old Curiosity Shop began serialisation in 1840. This was the year the first postage stamp, the Penny Post, was brought in by Rowland Hill, and the year the first bicycle was produced. The next major publication for Dickens was in 1842, when the first part of Martin Chuzzlewit appeared, and in 1848, Dombey and Son was published. Now, uh, do you have any questions before we go on to look at this work in some depth? No? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.